Here is part two of your review. I had you change 36 and 37 to these polynomials. When we did this, we sketched them. We didn't actually graph them. So I know your 36 and 37 has grids on them. I covered mine up. So you either can just ignore yours when you sketch this, or you can sketch it on a separate sheet of paper if you want to. But we couldn't graph them perfectly because we can't find relative maximums and minimums and increasing and decreasing intervals. At, with an exact science because that requires calculus that we don't know yet and just getting the numbers off the calculator just doesn't really do us any good so that means we also can't find the range uh, for all of them because we won't know some of the maximums and minimums we need so when we had this they were either already factored for us or we could factor them and then we had to find our x or our zeros so for this one it's gonna be two four and negative 2, so that's plus or minus 2 and 4. And then we had a had to do a number line so we could figure out where our polynomial was positive and negative and what any of the special points were. Well, this squared here, if you have an even exponent, um, then that means we have a bounce here. So this is our bounce because it's tangent to the axis there. That's our bounce, which is the tangent C and then um, on my number line I have negative 2 2 and 4 so all I care about here is signs whether it's positive or negative the actual number values don't matter just have to substitute in something less than a negative 2 so I'll choose like a negative 3 and I have actually four signs that I have to take care of, even though I only have three factors up here, because whatever this sign is times this one times this one, all that's times a negative one. So these signs could be different depending on what I substitute in, but this is going to be a negative no matter what. So I start off with a negative every time. Substitute in a negative three here, that'll give me a negative number. Negative three here gives me a negative number. This one will be positive every time because I square it. So when I multiply those together, I end up getting a negative number here. Substitute in my zero. Well, it's negative to begin with no matter what. Then it's negative, negative, positive. So it's negative here also, which should make sense because this is where your bounce is, right? It's where it's going to bounce off the x-axis. Then if I substitute in a positive 3, start off with a negative, and then that's going to be positive, then negative, then positive. So that is positive overall. Substitute in a 5, I start off with negative, and then positive, 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 which means that it is negative overall. So my polynomial is negative here, positive, oh, well, that is positive, actually negative there. Sorry, it's a negative, negative, because they don't always alternate, positive, negative. So that's where the values are for my polynomial. On my graph, I'm going to go and plot these points, my zero, so you can kind of see where the little grid was. I've got a negative 2, a positive 2, and a positive 4. So the other things that I have to have for this, I need to know what my end behavior is. Well, this is a 2, 1, and a 1, so this is a fourth degree. When it's an even degree, it has the end behavior of a quadratic, so it's either up, up, or down down your leading coefficient is negative which means it's down down so my end behavior is going to look like this okay then i also have to take into account my little bounce right here and i need my y intercept so y intercept is when x is zero so f of zero equals negative and then zero in here gives me negative two times negative four times a positive two squared so this is going to be positive 8 times a negative 1 is going to be negative 8. 2 squared is 4, so that's going to give me a negative 32. So my y-intercept is at 0, negative 32. So I'll just throw a point on here. We'll make this point 0, negative 32. Okay, so I have my y-intercept, my x-intercept, since it's set as intercepts, this is 0. No, it is not. It is negative 2. 0, 2, 0, and 4, 0. My domain for polynomials should always be all real numbers, so it's negative infinity to infinity. Okay, so I got all those pieces in, got everything I need to be able to sketch this. 
knowing what my end behavior looks like and that I have a tangency bounce here. I'm going to come up from negative infinity, bounces off my x-axis, comes down here through my y-intercept. Remember, I don't know that that's my minimum necessarily. And then it comes back up. I don't know how high it comes up, but then it comes back down. So it looks something like that, but hopefully a whole lot better for you. Mm -hmm. All right, so for 37, we we'll start off the same way. Find our x-intercepts. So this is going to be 0, 2, and negative 1. So 0, actually, negative 1, 0, and 2. need to have my number line here. So negative 1, 0, and 2. So if I substitute in a negative 2 here, it's going to give me negative. Since this is to the third power, it's going to be whatever, um, whatever the sign is because it's an odd exponent. So a negative 2 in here would give me another negative number, and then that one's negative also. So this is negative overall. A negative 1 half would give me negative, negative, positive. A positive 1 would give me positive, negative, positive, which is negative overall. 3 would give me positive, 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 so that is positive overall. So I've got that this is negative, positive, negative, positive. So this does alternate. This cubed right here, this actually gives me a point of inflection, which is your wiggle. We had a bounce and a wiggle. So on my graph, I'm going to plot the negative 1, the 0, and the 2. Oh, that's a 1. And the 2. The end behavior, this is 3, 4, 5, so it's an odd degree polynomial. So my end behavior looks like a cubic. That would be positive. This would be negative leading coefficient. My leading coefficient is positive. So this is my end behavior. My y-intercept is, I already found it, didn't even try it, it is 0, 0. My x-intercepts, again, since it said as intercepts, that should be negative 1, 0, 0, 0, and 2, 0. And then my domain is negative infinity to infinity. Okay, so I have all my pieces in there. This is my point of inflection here at this 2, and... Um, this is my end behavior, so I can come down like I am graphing a cubic, something like this, and this is going to come back up. Don't know how high, come back down, looks something like that. That is my sketched polynomial. Of course, I don't know how far down this goes or how far up this goes, but I just have, my, I have to have my point of inflection in there, my correct intercepts, know where it's positive and negative, all the good kind of stuff. All right, so let's look at the zeros of the polynomial function. It says, write the function in factored form. Identify the zeros and multiplicities and describe the effect on the graph. Okay, so I need to factor this. I can factor out an x here. So it's going to be x times x squared plus 10x plus 25, which means that f of x is equal to x times, well, this is your one of your special cases there, that is x plus 5 squared. It's a perfect square trinomial. And that means then that your zeros are negative 5 and 0. The multiplicity for negative 5 is 2. For 0, it is 1. When you have that multiplicity of 2, that means that it is tangent to the axis. It is a bounce, but your real words are tangent there. That multiplicity of 1 just means it passes through. It does intersect, but the tangent also intersects at that point, too. But it passes all the way through, so this is a pass oops, passes through. Okay. Then your factored form here, um, I can start by factoring this by grouping. You can factor out an x squared from these two and leave me with x plus 2. Factor out a negative 4 from those two, and that gives me x plus 2, which means that I'm going to get that, that equals x squared minus 4 times 
x plus 2. And then I can factor this right here. This becomes x plus 2 times x minus 2 times x plus 2, which means when I fix all of that, I get f of x equals x plus 2 squared times x minus 2. So minus 2. So my zeros then have a negative 2 and a positive 2. That negative 2 has a multiplicity of 2. The 2 has a multiplicity of 1. So again, this is tangent, and it passes through. If I had an odd multiplicity, then that would give me a point of inflection. All right, next page. So it says, use the remainder theorem to evaluate f of x at x equals c. So x equals c and c equals negative 2. That means that x equals negative 2, which means your factor is already solved. And here we just use um, synthetic division. So I'm going to have negative 2. And then I'm going to have a 3, negative 2, negative 6, 7, and negative 9. Okay, so bring down my 3. Gives me negative 6, negative 8, 16, 10, negative 20, negative 13, 26. With that negative 9, it gives me 17. So my remainder is 17, which means that f of negative 2 equals 17. All right, so then c equals 3. So 3 out here. And then my coefficients are negative 1. Don't forget your zeros in here because this goes x to the 5th to x to the 3rd. So you have to have a 0 for the x to the 4th, then a 7. You have to have a 0 for x squared, then a negative 18, then a positive 21. Bring this down. I get negative 1, negative 3, 3, negative 9, negative 2, negative 6, negative 18, negative 36, negative 108, and negative 87 in here. So f of 3 equals negative 87. So then I'm going to use the factor theorem to determine if the binomial is a linear factor of the function. Okay, so this is the binomial. If I set that equal to 0 and I solve it, I get that x equals 1. And I want to know if that is one of my factors. So I do long division or synthetic division here to see what happens. So my coefficients are 1, 4, negative 7, and negative 10. So bring down my 1, 1, 5, 5, negative 2, negative 2, negative 12. So the answer is no. Okay. If I got a remainder of 0, then the answer is yes, but the answer here is no. So then here, I use x equals negative 2, so I get negative 2. And then my coefficients are 3, 2, negative 20, negative 8, and 32. Bring down my 3, get negative 6, negative 4, 8, negative 12, positive... 24, positive 16, negative 32, my remainder is 0, so the answer here is yes. Okay, rational zero theorem. We list all possible rational zeros of the given function. So to do that, it's the factors of the constant over the factors of the leading coefficient. So basically it's the factors of 54 over the factors of 1, so it's just the factors of 54. So I have plus or minus 1, it's even, so it's plus or minus 2. It is divisible by 3, so it's plus or minus 3. 4 does not divide into there, neither does 5, but 6 does. Okay. 7 does not, 8 does not, 9 does. Now, 6 times 9 is 54. So now, just whatever 3 times whatever is will give me 54. I get that one that's plus or minus 18. And then 2 times plus or minus 27. And then 1 times plus or minus 54. So there are all of my possible 
rational zeros. For 45, do the same thing here, and it's the factors of 36 over the factors of 3. So I can just start with all of the factors of 36. So it'll give me plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3. 36 is divisible by 4, not by 5. It is divisible by 6. And then 6 times 6 is 36, so then it's 4 times 9, 3 times 12, 2 times 18, 1 times 36. Okay, so then basically I take all of these over 3 and don't repeat anything. So 1 over 3 will be plus or minus 1 third, then plus or minus 2 thirds. This would give me 3 thirds, which is 1, then 4 thirds, which I don't have yet, then 6 thirds. 6 thirds reduces to um, 2, and then 9 thirds, which is 3, 12 thirds, which is 4, and so forth and so on, so that's it. All right, 46. Descartes' rule of signs. So I'm looking for all possible positive and negative real zeros. Here's where I look for the change in signs. So I have, um, these are all positive, nothing changes. So my possible positive real solutions is zero. Then in order to do the other part, I have to find f of negative x. So basically I change the sign on everything that has an odd exponent. So this would be negative 3x to the fifth plus 4x to the fourth minus, minus, minus 7x cubed plus 11x squared minus x plus 15. Then I look at my sign changes. So this is negative to positive. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That means my possible negatives are going to be 5. And then down by 2, 3, 4, 1. 47. Negative, negative, K okay, change here. Positive, positive change here. So my possible positives are going to be 2 or 0. Then my negatives, I have to find f of negative x. So that's going to be equal to negative 7x to the fourth plus 2x cubed plus 4x squared minus 9x minus 23. So this is negative to plus 1, 2, that's 2. So my negatives are 2 or 0. All right, so then... This next part says, find all zeros for each function, simplify all irrational zeros and complex solutions, and then give the complete factorization of the function. So when we do this, if you can factor, factor it. That's the, it's definitely the easiest way to do it. They're not all factorable, but if they are, we go with that. So number 48 is definitely factorable. Treat it like a quadratic to begin with. Okay, so when we do this, Okay, if you need to factor by grouping, then we can make this 4 times negative 12 is going to be a negative 48. So this will give me 4x to the 4th plus 48x squared minus x squared minus 12. And then I can factor that by grouping. Out of here, I can pull out a 4x squared, and that leaves me with x squared plus 12, and then out of here I take out a negative 1, and that leaves me with x squared plus 12, which means the factored form here so far is equal to 4x squared minus 1 times x squared plus 12. I can factor it a little bit more. I can factor this, so this gives me f of x is equal to 2x plus 1, times 2x minus 1 times x squared plus 12. Okay, so then I'm going to find my zeros. When I do that, this one is x equals negative 1 half, x equals 1 half, and then x squared equals negative 12. So x is equal to the square root of negative 12, which means x equals 2i square root of 3. So my zeros then are 
plus or minus one half and plus or minus, oh, I want to take the square root. I need a plus or minus there. I missed that. Plus or minus two i square root of three. Okay, because this is a fourth degree, there should be four of them, and there is. Then I have to give the complete factorization. That means I make it look like a strange factoring that I have. So I have f of x equals, right? So then I can start with, I'm going to start with my imaginary ones. I get x plus 2i square root of 3 and x minus 2i square root of 3. It's really subtraction both times, but this is your minus a negative. So then here, I don't get to just plop this one half in there, because if I do, then all of my coefficients are 1, and I'll never get that 4. You can't leave a fraction in there, so this came from this. You got to, if you don't have that, you got to think about what you have, and you have to solve it. So x equals 1 half, multiply both sides by 2, you get 2x equals 1, so it's 2x minus 1. So I'd have 2x minus 1 times 2x plus 1. That is the complete factorization. There you go. All right, so then 49. 49 does not factor by grouping, so I need to find, um, I'm going to have to figure out what one of my solutions might be, or my factors might be. In order to do that, I have to have, figure out what my possibles are. So it's like what we did up there. I've used this 60 over 1, so it's all the factors of 60. So plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 4, plus or minus 5, plus or minus 6. 7 does not divide into there. Um, you're not going to get anything else until you get to 10. And so 6 times 10 is 60, so now I can just start working my way back up. Plus or minus 12, plus or minus 15, plus or minus 20, plus or minus 30, plus or minus 60. Okay. And then here's where I'm which is where I start. I can do, I can figure out how many negative and how many positive as well. Um, really, I think if I could just figure out one of them out, I should be able to factor the rest. So let's see what happens. I'll start with one. I'll start with one. My lean coefficients are one, nine, eight, and negative 60. Okay, so bring that one down. It's one, one, that's 10, 10, that's 18, 18, and Whatever that is, which is negative 42, by the way, it's not zero, and that's what matters. Because if it was zero, then it's a factor. So I'm just going to tell you, this one was not real nice. You have to go through a bunch of them, and then you're not going to get to anything until you get to a negative 6. So negative 6, I'm just going to spare you the time on the video. I'm using 1, 9, 8, and negative 60. Bring this down to get 1, bring in negative 6, 3, negative 18, so that's negative 10, so that's 60, so that's 0. So this negative 6 right here means that x plus 6 is a factor. And then this is what I have remaining. So that what I have right now then is f of x equals x plus 6 times x squared plus 3x minus 10. And then we hope that factors, because if not, we got to keep on going. And I could keep on going. I could try another one and another one and just and keep going with that. But um, if I have this, I can factor it, and I get f of x equals, so this is x plus 6. Leading coefficient is 1, so this is x, this is x, this is negative, so the signs are opposite. It's going to be a 2 and a 5. It's a positive 5 and a negative 2. So actually, positive 2 would have worked, too, as you get to that one. But once I have this, then here's my complete factorization, and my zeros are negative 6, negative 5, and 2. Okay. All right. So same thing here. This does not factor by grouping, and so I need to come up with all of my possibles. I'm looking for the factors of 51, so it'd be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 17, plus or minus 51. And then again, just to save time, I mean, you don't really know where to start, but I'll tell you that negative 3 is the one that works. And then we have 1, 5, 
23 and 51. 1, negative 3, 2, negative 6, 17, negative 51, and 0. So that means since this is negative 3, x plus 3 is a factor. So then I get that f of x is equal to x plus 3 times x squared plus 2x plus 17. So then I can't factor this because my only factors here are 1 and 17. There's nowhere for me, no way for me to get 2 out of that. So I'm going to have to do quadratic formula. Here I get x equals negative 3. Here I have x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2a. So that gives me negative 2 plus or minus the square root. So this is going to be 4 squared or 2 squared, which is 4. 4 times 17 is going to give me negative 68 all over 2. So this gives me negative 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 64 over 2. So it's negative 2 plus or minus. 8i over 2, which then gives me negative 1 plus or minus 4i. So my zeros, which I will write up here so that I can make them fit, the zeros that I have come up with are negative 3 and negative 1 plus or minus 4i. Oops. And that's three solutions, and it's x cubed. So my complete factorization then is f of x equals x plus 3 times, and then x minus a negative 1 plus 4i times, oh, and then close it again. Close, close, times x minus negative 1 minus 4i. There's my complete factorization there. And the zeros. 51. Again, this one does not factor. So I need my possible solutions here. Get plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 5 plus or minus 6 plus or minus 10 plus or minus 15 and plus or minus 30. Again, to save time, I will just tell you this will work once you get to 3, but you won't just know that. You might have to test a few. So we get 1, negative 11, 34, and negative 30. Bring that down, that's 1. 3, negative 8, negative 24, 10, 30, 0. So this positive 3, so that's why x minus 3 works. And then that gives me f of x equals x minus 3 times x squared minus 8x plus 10. So this does not factor. So once again, I'm going to have to use quadratic formula. So this x equals 3. I get x equals plus or minus, no, not plus or minus, sorry. x equals negative b. So b is negative 8. So negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. So that means I get 8 plus or minus the square root of 64 minus 40 all over 2. So that is 8 plus or minus the square root of 24 over 2. 8 plus or minus 2 square root of 6 over 2, which gives me then 4 plus or minus the square root of 6. And, all right, 
So my zeros here then are three and four plus or minus the square root of six. So then to get my complete factorization, f of x is equal to x minus 3 times x minus 4 plus the square root of 6 times x minus 4 minus the square root of 6. That's my factorization. All right, so now I'm going to write a polynomial function with the given zeros. And... So remember that this here, this 5 halves, I don't get to just plug that in. I have to think about it as x equals 5 halves, which means that I multiply both sides by 2, so I get 2x equals 5, so I end up with 2x minus 5. You don't necessarily have to write all that stuff down. I just want you to know where my thought process is coming from there. So f of x equals, so I have plus or minus i, so this is x plus i times x minus i. And then x going to be minus, not x minus 5 halves. I almost just substitute it right in there. This 5 halves, this is the factor right there. So it is 2x minus 5. It's multiplicity of 2, so it's squared. So this right here is a difference of 2 squares. So this is going to be x squared. And then it's minus i squared, i squared is negative 1, so minus a negative 1 is plus 1, and then 2x minus 5 squared is going to give me 4x squared, it's going to be minus 10x, so minus 20x plus 25, then I have to multiply all that out, that is going to give me 4x to the fourth minus 20x cubed plus 25x squared plus 4x squared minus 20x plus 25, combine all my like terms, and I get 4x to the fourth minus 20x cubed plus 29x squared minus 20x plus 25. All right, the next one. F, f of x is equal to, this is negative 4, so it's x minus a negative 4, which is x plus 4, times x plus 3 squared of 2, times x minus 3 squared of 2. So I'll take care of these two first, so I get x plus 4. This is a difference of squares, so it's just x squared minus 3 squared of 2 squared. When you do that, so 3 squared of 2 squared, you got to square the 3 and get 9, square the square root of 2 and get 2, so that gives me x squared minus 18. Then I'm going to multiply those and get x cubed minus 18x plus 4x squared minus 72. Combine all of my like terms and I get x cubed plus 4x squared minus 18x minus 72. All right. On to rationals. It says graph each function that identify its key characteristics. So there are certain things that we have to know for rationals. Remember your, um, your ratee? All right, so we had that ratee. All right, so we have to know our roots or our zeros. We find that from the numerator. So that negative 2x plus 6 equals 0. That means 2x equals 6, so x equals 3. It's my only 0 there. And again, it says x-intercept, so this is at 3, 0. The a is for the asymptotes, and so we, we will um, just look at the denominator there because we only care about the vertical asymptotes right now. That'll be um, x equals 1. And then um, the T is tangency and togetherness. That's whether or not I have any multiplicity in the numerator or denominator. I do not. 
And then my end behavior, I'm looking at asymptotes. Well, they are tied in degree. Since they are tied in degree, it is just the uh, ratio of the leading coefficients, which is going to be negative 2. So my horizontal asymptote then is y equals negative 2. And then my y is my y-intercept. That's substituting in 0 for x. That would leave me with 6 over a negative 1. So y would equal negative 6. So my y-intercept is 0, negative 6. Okay. So I have all of those pieces right now. And I'm going to go in here and graph this stuff. So my x-intercept, I have one at 3, 0. I have 0, negative 6 for my y-intercept. I have a vertical asymptote at x equals 1. And I have a horizontal asymptote at y equals negative 2. Okay, you can just put that on my desk. Okay, thanks. All right, so then... My domain. Well, my domain is affected by my x's. I don't have any holes or anything here. Nothing canceled out, so I don't have any holes. I also don't have a slant asymptote. Bye. And um, so my domain is just going to go from negative infinity to 1, not including either one of them, and then from 1 to infinity. My range is going from negative infinity to negative 2, and then from negative 2 to infinity. All right, so it would be helpful to maybe figure out another point or two. I feel like this one probably gives me good enough information for this shape right here. But this one, you know, I don't know if it comes up real close. I don't know if it swings way out here. So maybe I figure out what's going on at when x is negative 1. That might be another good one for me to find. So if I substitute in a negative 1, we get negative 2 times, so x is negative 1. Negative 2 times negative 1 plus 6 over negative 1 minus 1. So it's going to give me 8 over, I put negative 1 minus 2, negative 1 minus 1, over negative 2, which is going to give me negative 4. So if I go to a negative 1, negative 4, shoot, here's 0, 0, negative 1, negative 4, right there, that's another good point, I think that's enough to be able to draw that graph in, and there you go, there's my rational, alright, next one, so I need to factor this, Right. When I do this, this is going to give me um, x squared times, no, not x squared, the numerator, I'm going to multiply, factor out x times x squared minus 4 over x times x plus 1, and then I keep going and I get x times x plus 2 times x minus 2 all over x times x plus 1. Okay, so do I have any holes? Yes, I do. I have holes right here. Okay, when x is 0, so when x is 0, then I'll have to figure out what the y value is here in just a second. So for my domain, x cannot equal 0, and x cannot equal a negative 1. So it's the set of all x's such that x cannot equal negative 1 or 0. My, so when we look at radii, and what was PPD radii, where we had to look for point discontinuity and the parent function. It doesn't have a parent function, there's my point discontinuity, and then I have to remember to do my radii. So the roots, those are my x-intercepts, I'm getting them from here. It's after I have canceled things out. So my, the only thing you do before you actually get rid of it is the domain and finding your holes. Then when you have what's reduced, x plus 2 times x minus 2 over x plus 1, that's when you get to do 
everything else. My x-intercepts are going to be at negative 2, 0, and 2, 0. So I'll go ahead and graph those negative 2, 0, and 2, 0. My y-intercept, I'll find that in just a second, but I've got my asymptotes down here, so vertical asymptote x equals negative 1. Okay, and then the whole, so if I substitute in 0 here, substitute in 0 for x, I'm going to get 2 times a negative 2 over 1, which gives me negative 4. So my whole is at 0, negative 4. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, guess what? That's also the y-intercept. 0, negative 4. But it's a whole, so it doesn't really, really intersect there. Um, all right, then I need my horizontal asymptote. Well, it's the numerator is one degree higher than the denominator. Therefore, I need to, um, therefore, it's, there's not a horizontal asymptote. It is none. And I need to find the slant asymptote. Well, when I've multiplied this back together, so the, this is the same thing as f of x equals x squared minus 4 over x plus 1. So since this is just one degree higher, I can actually use synthetic division. So when I do that, I'll have negative one. Divide that into, this is one, that I have a zero term there, and then a negative four. So I bring down my one. This gives me negative one, negative one, one, negative three. And then I just ignore the remainder and my slant asymptote is y equals x minus 1. So y equals x minus 1. Here's my y-intercept and then my graph. Something sort of like that. And then I have a, my vertical asymptote was at x equals negative 1. It's right here. Once I graph all that in there, I think I am good to go. And this looks like this here. I didn't do a sign chart on either one of these because um, I don't think they really needed them, but some of them will need them. So don't forget, I should probably do that. Um, on your sign chart, go your x-intercepts and your vertical asymptotes. So we have something at negative 2, at negative 1, and at 0. So when I do the signs, just like we had done before, I'm going to use this this one right here to do that. It makes it easier. If I substitute in a negative 3, it's going to give me negative, 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 which means it's negative overall. Substitute in a negative 1.5, this will give me positive, negative, negative, which makes that positive overall. A negative one-half is going to give me, oh, shoot, it's not a negative one. Oh, I left off my positive two. Oh. Okay, that is a negative one. I just realized I left off something. I left off my positive two. So I hadn't messed up just yet. <laughs> Almost. I was on my way to mess up. That's two. Okay, so this negative one-half, when I substitute it in here, is going to give me positive, negative, positive, which is negative overall. Positive one I can choose will give me positive, negative, positive. That's negative overall. Three gives me positive, 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 which makes that positive overall. So what this tells me about my graph then is from zero to negative, inf neg from, sorry, from negative infinity to negative two, it's negative. That makes sense. There we go. From negative two to negative one, it's positive. Well, from negative two to negative one, it's positive. From negative one to zero, it is why do I have zero on there? That's what I did wrong. I don't need that one. Duh. 
Well, yeah, I mean, well, it makes sense, though. From negative 1 to 0, it is negative, and then it's still negative, but I didn't actually make it to the x-axis. That's what I did wrong. I, when I, I put the 0 on there instead of the 2, and when I forgot it. But then, um, so it's actually negative all the way to positive 2, and then from positive 2 to infinity, it's positive. So this is definitely necessary for um, some of them when you don't have enough information already graphed on there. But because of the nature of the points and what came up there, I didn't. it, it was doable without it. All right. So graphs of exponentials and logarithmic, logarithmic functions. So it's to classify each function as exponential growth or decay. Well, the base is greater than 1 here, so this is growth. Base is greater than 1, this is growth. Base is less than 1, this is decay. All right, so let's graph them. Okay, getting it straight in your head, the, diff the difference between exponential and logarithmic is very, very important. So you need to think about your little parent functions, right? Parent function looks like this for an exponential, or it could look like this. Just having, really just having this one in your brain is really good enough, because it tells you that it's going to have an, an intercept, an intercept on the y-axis, which means you have a horizontal asymptote. That's so important. You got to get your asymptotes on there correctly so that you know what's going on and you're worried about a y-intercept, not an x-intercept. I know I messed that up on a lot of papers, but we kept fixing it, so at least you should remember that it's something different. Um, so I do have a horizontal asymptote. Your horizontal asymptotes are only affected by vertical shifts. So it actually belongs at y equals zero. I have a vertical shift or translate up one, which means my asymptote translates up one. Okay, that's huge. And then your parent function is going to be f of x equals one half to the x power. So think about what, what, what that makes your anchor points so that you know where to go with the rest of them. So one half, or regardless of what the base is, whether it's this or this, one of your anchor points is zero, one. Then you look at what, this is a vertical stretch by a factor of 4. Makes my y value instead of 1, makes it 4. Then this right here is a shift to the right 1, and then I go up 1. There's that new point. Then when x is negative 1, since the base is 1 half, then my anchor point would be negative 1, 2. I have a vertical stretch by a factor of 4, which changes that to 8. I go to the right one, and then I go up one, which takes me a little off my graph, but that's doable. When, for my anchor point, when x is 1, y is positive 1 half, then I have a vertical stretch by a factor of 4, which gets me to 2, go to the right one, and up one. There are my anchor points, and my graph looks like this. Oh. But make sure you hit the points. Dang it. It always looks so good with this pen and then it just misses. Okay. There we go. Alright. So then 60. Still an exponential, which means it is still going to have a horizontal asymptote. This is a shift down of 4, so my horizontal asymptote goes down to negative 4. Right here. This is a vertical stretch by a factor of 3, and then I go to the left 2 and down 4, and it's E. But you know what? Still, I start with an anchor point of 0, 1. Vertical stretch by a factor of 3 changes my y value to 3. I go to the left 2, and I go down 1, 2, 3, 4. There's a point. For my parent function, so my parent function is f of x equals e to the x. So when x is 1, y is about 2.7. Vertical stretch by a factor of 3. All right, well, it's about 2.7. 3 times 27 is 81. So that's about 8.1 when I stretch it, a little bit more than 8. I'm going to go left 2, and I go down 4. That point's right there. So then when I, x is negative 1, it's about 0.36. So 0.36 times 3 is 
still going to be less than, well, it's 36 times 3 is 108. So 0.36 times 3 is about a little bit more than 1, so I'm about right there. And then I go to the left 2, and I go down 4. There are my new points. Draw in the graph. It looks something like that. Okay. All right. Oh, I did not answer these questions. Okay, so my domain, I'll go back to 59. Domain for the exponential is always negative infinity to infinity. All right. The range depends on what's happening here. So my range goes from positive 1 to infinity, not including the 1. So here, domain, it's still negative infinity to infinity. My range starts at negative 4, goes to infinity. Your y-intercept, so my y-intercept here, we already found it. It was right here at 0, 9. My y-intercept on this one, I'm going to have to do some calculations here. So I want f of 0, that's equal to 3 times e to the well, 0 plus 2 is 2 power minus 4. That's the best you can do. So that is 0, comma, 3e squared minus 4. So your asymptotes, this, these are exponentials. Exponentials have horizontal asymptotes, so it's y equals, y equals. That asymptote is it starts at 0, and then it's affected by the vertical translation. So it's y equals 1, and y equals negative 1. So let's look at 61 and 62. I want you to think of them this way. These are logs. Your parent function for logs look like this or like this. Okay. And really just having one of them in mind is good enough because that tells you that you have an x-intercept here and a vertical asymptote. So when we go to answer these questions, your asymptotes are vertical asymptotes. They're going to be x equals, x equals. It starts at 0. It is affected by the horizontal shift. This is translating to the right 1. So instead of at 0, your asymptote is at x equals 1. Just go ahead and graph that in there. And over here, you have a horizontal translation left 4, so x equals negative 4. Instead of being at 0, it goes to left 1, 2, 3, 4, and we're right here. Okay. So I got those down. The domain for logs is dependent on those horizontal shifts and reflections and things, but your range is negative infinity to infinity, always. Remember, these are inverses of each other. I mean, not these specific ones, but exponentials and logs are inverses of each other. So um, this range, if domain is always negative infinity to infinity for exponential, that means range is negative infinity to infinity for logs every time. Okay. Domain is going to depend, and then x-intercept might be something that we have to go and calculate. We start at 1, 0, but then things change. All right, so let's... Go back and fill in the rest of this stuff. I'm going to rewrite my parent function in exponential form. The base is 1 fourth. It's 1 fourth to the y power equals x. This is the one where you write your table backwards, basically, and why we actually wrote a table down. Because you need to, you can't really substitute something in for x and solve for y without doing a log, and the whole point is that we're trying to do this without having to calculate all that stuff. So instead, I choose numbers for y. Those are the three I choose every single time, because I'm using the parent function, and then I'll do the transformations. Well, if the base is 1 fourth, when y is negative 1, this is 4, and then 1, and then 1 fourth. So my anchor points. 4, negative 1. So 1, 2, 3, 4, and 8. That's an anchor point. My transformations here, I'm going to go to the right 1 and up 1. So I lost my anchor point. 1, 2, 3, 4, and okay. So I'm going to go to the right 1 and up 1. There's my point. Another anchor point is at 1, 0. Then I go to the right 1 and up 1. 1, fourth 1. So 1, fourth 1. I'm right here. Then I go to the right 1 and up 1. There are my new points, 
and my graph looks something like that. So my domain then goes from 1 to infinity, not including that. And my x-intercept, I actually have it. It's one of my points. It is at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0. All right, so then let's look at this one. I'm going to rewrite my parent function. It's going to be 4 to the y power equals x. y is negative 1, 0, and 1. So this would be 1 fourth, 1, and 4. So my anchor points. When x is 1 fourth, y is a negative 1. I'm going to go to the, this says I go to the left 4 and up 2. So 1 fourth, negative 1. I go to the left 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, and up 1, 2. I'm right there. 1, 0. I go to the left 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, and up 2. 1, 2. Then I'm going to go to the left. All right, I have to start at 4, 1. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1. Go to the left 4 and up 2. I'm right there. So my graph looks something like this. And then I know what my y-intercept is, but that's not what I want. I want my x-intercept and then my domain. Domain goes from negative 4 to infinity. My x-intercept I need to find, so I'm going to uh, set y equal to 0. That's equal to log base 4 of x plus 4 plus 2. I'm going to subtract 2 from both sides, so I get negative 2 equals log base 4 of x plus 4. So now that I have the, um, I have a single log over here, I can rewrite this in exponential form. So this is going to be 4 to the negative 2 power equals x plus 4. So 4 to the negative 2 is 1 over 16. It's equal to x plus 4. Subtract 4 from both sides, so this is going to give me x equals 1 16th minus 4, so that's really going to be negative 3 and 15 sixteenths, comma 0. So almost negative 4, and that's right where we are, almost negative 4. Okay, that's the end of part 2.